Good afternoon and good morning if you are in this side of the world. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in the International Talks and Talks 2021. And I am going to continue discussing about snake venoms and present to you today the findings of our research on basement membrane degradation and the role inflammation plays in the pulmonary hemorrhage induced by a P3 snake venom metalloproteinase. As I was all already introduced, I am Ana Cristina Castro from the Instituto Clodomiro Picado at the University of Costa Rica. So a snake bite and venom is a neglected tropical disease. It occurs to around 1.2 and 2.7 million people worldwide, and mainly in, in tropical areas, as you can see in this map on the right, of people affected by this 400,000 can develop serious health consequences such as amputation of the limb affected and over 8,000 culminating death. Biparid snake and venom in patients can present local and systemic effects. Hemorrhage is the most important effect due to its significant association with a negative prognosis. Both local and systemic hemorrhage effects can be seen in these images on the right. Cretalosimus venom has been shown to cause hemorrhagic effects. In this image on the left, you can see its complete protein composition. As you can see, a main component are snake venom metalloproteinases, or SBMPs, and these are responsible for hemorrhage. As observed in the complete protein composition, SBMPs are a major component, especially type P3. This study focused on CSH1, which is a type P3 SBMP. This is a glycosylated monomeric protein of 55 kilodaltons, which causes local and systemic hemorrhage. This photograph shown a crotalusimus specimen. In the studies of local hemorrhage caused by SBMPs, a two-step model has been proposed that explains the action of hemorrhagic SBMPs. In the first step, SBMP binds to the capillary and hydrolyzes critical structural components of the basement membrane and extracellular uh, matrix, particularly type 4 collagen, laminin, and perlican. This effect results in this second step in the mechanical weakening of the extracellular matrix, leading to the capillary becoming susceptible to rupture due to the biophysical hemodynamic forces that normally occurs in the microcirculation. Most studies of the pathogenesis of SBMP-induced hemorrhage has been focused on the phenomenon of local hemorrhage as explained previously. This work studies systemic hemorrhage, specifically as it occurs in the lung. First of all, pulmonary tissue is highly vascularized, as you can see here. And as the image of the right shows, has a fused, you can see here, a fused basement membrane. Pulmonary tissue, then is very interested, interesting to be in studying. So here we have a, a question that we ask our, ourselves, that is, is CSH1 associated with acute lung injury and hemorrhage? So to answer this question first, we assess whether CSH1 induced pulmonary hemorrhage after intravenous application of 8.75 micrograms of purified CSH1 per gram of body weight of CD1 mice. The lungs were excised and histological preparations were stained with hematoxylin eosine and these preparations were observed in light microscopy. The PVS control lung tissue maintained its structure as you can see here. The alveoli were free of erythrocytes and any other, any other protein or any other exudate. In contrast, in lung tissue of mice treated with the toxin, erythrocyte filled the alveolar space, as shown with these arrows. This findings confirm the rapid onset of the pulmonary hemorrhage caused by the toxin, as you can see in 15 minutes, but it can continue to develop for 360 minutes, as you can see here. So another important observation we can see was an inflammatory infiltrate in the pulmonary parenchyma, which was more prominent at 360 minutes, as you can see here in this figure D. 
In order to determine if inflammation was also occurring in this model, bronchiolar leverage samples were obtained and analyzed for cellularity and protein composition. Figures A and B show an increase in total protein and albumin concentration in samples obtained from mice treated with a toxin at 15 minutes and 360 compared with control. Figure C shows that cell counts from these bulk samples were increased significantly as time progresses as well. Finally, figure D shows the results of a gelatin cymography of bulk of the murine model. In the control shown as C15 and C360, two main gelatinolytic bands of 60 and 110 kilodaltons are observed which corresponds to MMP2 and MMP9. Moreover, in mice treated with CSH1, the intensity of these bands increased, highlighted here with the arrows, and additional bands were also observed in the samples, which correspond to MMP activity during the exposure to the toxin. Altogether, these findings confirm the existence of inflammatory processes in the lung elicited by CSH1. In order to determine if basement membrane proteins were affected, as was reported previously for local hemorrhage, we observed this process with long homogenates presented here in the left, as well as analyzing bulk samples on the right. Using immunodetection of these proteins and any degradation products through Western blood with antibodies against specific basement membrane proteins. For all of these experiments, the loading control for lung homogenate was acting while there was no loading control for bowel samples. In the case of collagen type 4 control samples, it did show some immunoreactive bands that correspond to the molecular masses of collagen change, which are 180 and 130, as well as another band of 300 kilodaltons, which reflects aggregates of these proteins while T15 and T360 show the same bands, as well as some bands of lower molecular weight, which correspond to degradation products. In contrast, bulk samples here in the, in the right do not show any bands, as you can see in the control, but treated samples display monoreactive bands, which are more prominent at 360 minutes and a band of 90 kilodaltons was observed at this time point. In the case of laminin, another important component of this basement membrane, long homogenates control samples show bands with the expected molecular weights for native laminin subunits of more than 300, 250, and a faint one here of 150 kilodaltons. After the injection of the toxin, however, new bands appeared which corresponds to degradation products become more apparent. Bulk samples, on the other hand, show three immunoreactive bands of low molecular weight, which are likely to be degradation products. Notably, lung homogeny show no apparent degradation of nitrogen, as you can see in this image. Nevertheless, bulk samples show three main bands of low molecular weight in all four groups, and an additional band of 130 kilodaltons was detected in treatment groups, which corresponds to the intact nitrogen, nitrogen chain. Our findings clearly reveal that when injected intravenously, CSH1 is capable of hydrolyzing basement membrane proteins in the lung, and that degradation products of these proteins are present in the bulk. The fact that such degradation was observed at 15 minutes indicate that it is a direct and rapid process. Following the molecular study of CSH1 perturbation, it became of interest to assess whether inflammatory mediators are on cells might contribute to the pathogenesis of hemorrhage in this model. To this end, a method for macroscopic quantitative assessment of hemorrhage in the lungs through digital image analysis was developed. This method consists of photographing excites lung tissues, under different treatment conditions, and then applying a set of well-defined image processing operations. This procedure enables a reproducible and standardized analysis of lung hemorrhage, which is quantified as the total hemorrhagic lung area identified in the images 
and enables to see small differences in hemorrhage in the experimental groups. The diagram in the left summarizes the overall flow of the procedure. After injection of PBS or CSH1, the pulmonary organ was excised and an image and a digital photograph was obtained. The images on the right show an actual photograph as they are processed by the image analysis pipeline implemented with cell profiler. This digital image analysis procedure was used to determine the role inflammation plays in lung hemorrhage. Lung photographs from mice with PVS as control, the toxin and three anti-inflammatory pretreatments applied intraperitoneally were processed and compared. The anti-inflammatory agents selected for this determination were, first of all, indomethacin, which is a COX inhibitor, pentoxifilin, which is a TNF-alpha inhibitor, and antineutrophil antibodies. The results shown here compare control, the toxin, and each anti-inflammatory agent respectively. Our observations show that the three treatments reduce the extent of hemorrhage. This implies that COX-derived products such as prostaglandins, TNF-alpha, and neutrophils contribute to the extent of hemorrhage caused by CSH1. The fact that inhibition of three different inflammatory pathways and cells in this study resulted in a drop in the extent of hemorrhage suggests that various mediators are likely to play a role in this phenomenon. Moreover, this finding paves the way for the search of anti-inflammatory agents as potential therapies for SBMP-induced pulmonary damage and hemorrhage. Given the presence of basement membrane degradation products, it is clear that CSH1 is responsible for significant pathological disruption in the lung. This then leads to the question, how does CSH1 reach the alveolar capillary basement membrane? It is well known that type P3 SBMP have one disintegrating and one cysteine rich domain. When CSH1 reaches the vasculature, it can bind to target sites through the exocytes located in these domains, which enable the proteinase to bind to target sites in the microvasculature. Microvasculature, from this key characteristic, it is possible to, to uh, develop four possible mechanisms by which CSH1 is, may reach the basement membrane at the luminal side of the pulmonary capillary wall. First, CSH1 may cleave proteins in the endothelial cells intercellular junctions. Second, inflammatory reaction could widen these intercellular junctions of the endothelium. Three, CSH1 may pass through the endothelial cells by a transitosis-like mechanism. And four, CSH1 may cause direct damage to endothelial cells. Whether one or various of these mechanisms operate remains to be explored. So in conclusion, we see that CSH1 induces pulmonary hemorrhage of rapid onset in mice. It hydrolyzes components of the pulmonary basement membrane. It induces inflammation in the lungs. And inflammatory mediators play a role in the hemorrhagic effects. Finally, I would like to thank Drs. Jose Maria Gutierrez, Teresa Escalante, and Alexandra Rucavado, as well as the staff at the Instituto Clomiro Picado and the LQT lab at the University of Costa Rica. This project wouldn't have been possible without the funding from the Secretaría de Investigación of the University of Costa Rica. Thank you very much for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. So there is, uh, there's two questions from Charlene in the chat, so I'll ask each of them separately. So first, do you know if anti-venom administration is able to counter the pulmonary hemorrhage? It could be. Yeah, it could be. The problem is that the pulmonary hemorrhage develops a little bit delayed in the, in the, um, in the snake venoming process. So in this case, if you see, we use a really high Mm, concentration of the toxin because we were we were we wanted to see the process to be immediately but it is not the reality in, in the snake envenomment but it could be it could be a good a good way of of treating this type of, of hemorrhage 
And did you see, or do you see pulmonary hemorrhage of similar severity through other venom administration routes? We only, well, no, if you, if you apply the venom through the skin, the venom will not go through, through the veins and go all the way up to the, to the pulmonary parenchyma and, and you will not see hemorrhage, not that usual, but in this case, as you can see also, we, we applied it intravenously so that we can have the effect immediately. But this is a very interesting question because if you can just see the, the, the phenomenon that we have been studying is you got these mice, you get to administrate the venom and the venom through the tail and all the way up goes to the lung. And it is an interesting question. Why, why do you apply the venom in the, in the tail and you are going to see hemorrhage in the in the in the lung is it, that was our question and it seems that inflammation has a, a role in this in this process and that is why we see the pulmonary hemorrhage cool are there any other questions in the chat i'll give people a few more minutes Um, as someone who, again, works on invertebrates, so even <laughs> lungs is something that I just don't think about all that much. I've, I'm just curious, have you tried this in other models, other kinds of models other than mice? I know this is very optimized for mice, but I'm just curious if, you, if you've tried this. No, we haven't. No. Okay. What we are now trying to use, again, with other models, but in the case of other venoms, is the bronchial velar leverage. We're, we're, in, we're interested in that pathway, knowing yeah. what, what is going on in the lung, but we haven't tried any other animal models. Okay. Well, you have your info up there. I'm sure some others will have some questions for you too, but thank you so much for presenting. That is super thank cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was our last speaker.